I am so honored to kind of help introduce today's guest. And uh, for any of you who didn't join our first EO Exchange event, just wanted to give a little bit of background on what this uh, new series is, what the goal of it is. And um, the, the vision was to create an opportunity to hear from some outstanding people, but also to still cultivate a bit of uh, uh, community and connection. Um, so what we're gonna do instead of having just the uh, presentation is we'll do one part presentation and we'll do one part Q and A. And at the very end, we'll break out and we'll do some individual connection um, for the last 15 minutes. So um, we, we did have some pretty great feedback from the first session and uh, we're, we're looking forward to today. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will we'll use those to inspire our conversation in the Q&A section. So uh, today's topic is extremely timely and relevant. Uh, it is pandemic, pandemonium and payoff. And today's guest is Jim Cumby. Uh, he is an absolute expert his resume is just like blowing my mind. I can't believe that he's with us today. So cool. Um, here's a couple of quick facts. For more than 25 years, Jim has been involved in the business of M&A, merger and acquisitions, execution and strategic planning. He is an attorney, so he has a law degree and has an MBA from Harvard Business School. I think I've heard of that before. And uh, he has been with EO Nashville as an SAP for eight years. He helps many EO members sell their businesses, buy a business, um, think through strategic decisions related to M&A. And he um, really understands what it means to be an entrepreneur. In the mid nineties, he left a role as a VP of strategic planning uh, with Disney. And he bought a fledging radio business in Nashville. He turned it around in four years and sold it to a publicly traded radio conglomerate. Jim and his wife, Emily, have been married for 35 years, have three adult children and five grandchildren. And Jim says there isn't much he hasn't seen or done through his longstanding relationship with EO Nashville. And that's why he loves to join us and do presentations like this. And we're so thankful for Jim being willing to uh, adjust a bit and uh, try out this new format. So with that, I will turn the time over to Jim. And reminder, drop your, your thoughts and questions in the Q&A. And please do stick around for the final 15 minutes of breakouts. OK, great. Um, can you see my screen? We good? You see a PowerPoint? The PowerPoint's more interesting than I am. Uh, am I hearing me OK? Let's just get the basics down. Can you hear me OK? Show of hands, OK, thanks, Marty. Um, <clears throat> I see some familiar faces out there, some friends. Um, Samira, when I um, when when you asked me about that background, I said I've been a uh, SAP for eight years. Do you know is that is that right? I was trying to do the math. It's seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. Um, all I remember when I became an uh, uh, when I first was introduced to uh, EO, I met um, uh, Tim Osginer and Ben Handbeck were the SAP chairs. And, and those guys, I mean, they, they sold me pretty quickly. Uh, and I remember, I remember seriously, like it was yesterday, going to an SAP, going to an event, an EO event. It was one that already put on with uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, what's the lady's name? Um, Sally uh, Hogshead? Yeah, Sally Hogshead, yeah. And, um, that big event he had down at the the Omni Hotel, or, uh, the um, not the Omni, but the um, uh, Hilton. Hilton, thank you. And it was sitting out there and looking across the crowd, and and Tim Tim Skinner, who may be the, like the best peer salesman you know on the planet, put his arm around me and said, "Jim, this is your audience." You know, you so and he he was right. I mean, he was absolutely right. I have so much enjoyed my time with with you guys as an organization. Um, many of you kept me busy professionally, but beyond that, 
I've made some good friends and I, I really do appreciate the organization. And I've said, I've said before, I'll just say it again. I, I think one reason I'm so passionate about my involvement with EO beyond the fact that it's a good business for me and I've made some good friendships is I know what I missed when I owned my radio business. Um, uh, I, I didn't have the benefit of an EO kind of organization. Um, so I, I, I made all those entrepreneurial decisions by myself and, uh, I didn't, I didn't have the collegiality and the feedback and the support that, that your organization provides each other. So I, I, I know what I missed. And, uh, uh, so it's, it's kind of nice to be able to participate in it at this level. So, um, I want to talk today about the stock market and the pandemic and how the vaccine is all kind of coming together to literally affect the saleability of businesses today. Uh, now I'll, I'll start with it, just kind of a background or kind of where the where the private where the market is today, uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about two kinds of buyers. I'm going to talk about private equity, and I'm going to talk about um, um, strategic buyers. The private equity market is really very simple to understand, and and this is this is really all you need to know about private equity. You are you are a candidate for private equity. If you can show them how they can return two and a half times on the invested equity over five years, it's a re it's a really incredibly simple formula, and um, and so that means when I say invested equity, assume they buy your company and 50% of it is debt and 50% of it is equity. If you can do math that says over five years, I can help you double your equity then you're a candidate for private equity. And the way the math works, and I'm happy to send you a spreadsheet to show you this, but the way the math works, that really means, can you double your company over five years? If you can show that, you're a candidate for private equity. Now, in today's environment, you're, you're a candidate for a strategic buyer. Um, if, you can, if you can show them how your business is strategic to theirs. And that is so situational, I can't give you any like, three or four bullet points. It's a very kind of individual um, um, uh, question for an individual company at an individual point in time, but that is really how strategics make their decisions. So let's talk about the stock market, the pandemic and the vaccine and what, what, how, it, how those three things affect this, this template. The roaring stock market has resulted in more money flowing into private equity. And that may seem a little counterintuitive, but as, 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 stock, as equities are, are proven to be more expensive, um, they're perceived to be more risky, right? So uh, to kind of counter that risk, uh, institutional investors like pension funds and whatnot um, are looking for balance in their portfolio. So they find that balance in private equity. So as the stock market goes up, uh, that means more money will flow into private equity. Now, what, so what has the pandemic done to the business? I've watched this over the past 12 months. The pandemic has caused buyers, when I say buyers, we're talking strategic and private equity, uh, to be more focused on stability and, in fact, certainty in the business model going forward. And what does the vaccine mean? Well, the, the vaccine as it's coming, uh, I can tell you, tells me one thing and one thing only, and that is it's time to get your surfboard ready. And I'll explain what that means a little later, but hold that thought. Now, let's talk um, next about those of you that have, have been around me before know that you know one of my st standard themes is be ready to sell before you intend to sell. I've said that hundreds of times and um, it's, it's as true today as it was eight or nine years ago when I, when I got involved with the, uh, I've been making this point for a long time. And it's really important to understand why I say this. There are studies out there that kind of have looked at business owners and their, their, their kind of the lifestyle of the selling decision. And here's what those studies have, have shown us. Um, at any point in time, there are 30% of the business owners who know they are not ready to sell, have no intention of selling. 30% don't think they are ready. 30% of business owners 
haven't thought about selling, but are open to it. 7% are actively thinking about it. And at any point in time, there are about 3% of all businesses that are sort of on the market or ready to go onto the market. So when I, when I talk about being ready to sell, I'm really talking about these two groups. These groups that you, you kind of haven't moved it to the front burner yet, <clears throat> but you know it might be on your radar screen uh, if circumstances warranted. And the other kind of key principle you've heard me say over and over is um, it's proven the catalyst for most sales processes is not a decision of the business owner. There's some external driver. And these external drivers are and um, the, what I call the seven D's, divorce, disagreement, disengagement, distress, disability, death, or destiny. And destiny means, the, those, the first six are pretty obvious. When I say destiny, I mean, there's something that happens around you that kind of forces a sale. Um, in my case, the destiny was I had a radio business that I intended to run for the rest of my life. I never intended to sell my radio business. But um, three years after I bought this fledgling business and turned it around and consolidated, I consolidated actually three acquisitions into one business, doing fine, making money, I was happy, kind of going to be an entrepreneur the rest of my life. But Congress deregulated radio ownership and my station value skyrocketed overnight because of supply and demand that kicked in because of the change of law. Well, that's destiny. Well, sometimes destiny works to your favor. Sometimes it works against you. But the point being, each of these seven factors, if you, if you all could monitor my phone calls for a month, this is what I hear. When people call me for the first time, it's one of these seven fit factors that caused, that caused them to call me. In fact, it's proven that 75% of all business sales are, are driven by an external circumstance. So the point being, it's really important to be ready um, to sell before you intend to sell. Now, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over one more point that you've heard before, before we dive into some new information, but this is really important to remember this basic. What does it mean to be ready? Okay, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you, you, wanna, you wanna manage your business such that you have a diverse customer base. You need to have your financials reviewed or audited. You want to be able to prove that you have a sustainable revenue stream. You want to be able to prove demonstrable scalability. And by that, I mean that as you grow, you get more profitable, that every new dollar of growth creates incremental profitability. You want to demonstrate a unique market position. You want to have a believable growth story. And you want to prove that you are, the business is not relying on you. The owner is independent of the business. Now you've heard before, those are the things I call the seven principles of irresistibility. So those, those, are, those are how you get your business ready to be sold. Now, here's the new theme though. The new theme is a big honk and wave is coming. Now, I was last March, just before the pandemic hit, my wife and I went with my son and his wife and daughter to Hawaii and kind of did all the stuff that you enjoy in Hawaii. But we spent about a day on the north shore of um, uh, Oahu, you know, where, which is one of the places where they have the, you know, the big waves. And uh, it was so much fun just watching those surfers and kind of how, which by the way, I would never even try to surf, but um, you know, you kind of know that when a big wave is coming, you got to get ready. So what's the, what do you need when a big wave is coming? Well, obviously you need a surfboard. So how do I kind of translate that metaphor to, to reality today? <clears throat> if you know a big wave is coming in the marketplace, what you really need, my, my, my metaphor of a surfboard is you need, to, you need to get a book. You need to get a book on your company. And this is a specific action plan I'm gonna encourage you, and that is to prepare your book now. Now, what does your book mean? Your book is gonna have nine chapters in it. Chapter number one is your business model. What do you do and how do you make money? Chapter number two, your company history. Chapter, chapter number three, an overview of your industry. Chapter four, your organization. 
Chapter five, a profile of your customer. Chapter six, obviously your financial history. Chapter seven, you want to grade yourself on the seven principles of irresistibility. And the, the reason that's important, you've heard me say before, that's the principles of irresistibility or how a buyer looks at your business. They, they may not express it quite that way, but that's how they look at your business. So go ahead and grade yourself <coughs> on those principles. Chapter eight, you want to you want to demonstrate your 2x growth plan. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute. The number number uh, nine, you want to have a chapter on who the potential strategic buyers for your company would be, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. The the the, the point being, you want to write your book now. You get get you know get your surfboard ready. The wave is coming. Have your book ready. So, what does your book give you? Well. It gives you instant credibility when a when a potential buyer calls you. Um, you can you can have this ready, and you know that that will impress them. Number two, it's a it's an exercise to help you kind of think through the strengths and weaknesses of your business. Uh, uh, in helping business owners prepare their book, um, they they've learned some things about their company. Second and thirdly, obviously, it, it, it's speed to market. It, it gets you in the market faster and you can be more um, uh, reactive to, to opportunities. And then finally, having a book just helps you prepare for what you don't know is coming. So that's, that's what your book gives you, credibility, a heads up on your strengths and weaknesses, speed to market, and preparation for what you don't know is coming. Now, Every time I give a presentation, people always want to talk about valuations. So let me kind of give you an overview of, of where that stands today. Um, you know, you've heard me say before, valuations are a function of two, two factors, your, your revenue growth and your profit margin. So buyers will kind of triangulate between these two factors. I just finished a call 15 minutes ago with the private equity group in Tampa on behalf of a client of mine. And we talked about these two, these two factors, revenue growth, and profit margin. So if you have low revenue growth and low profit margin, your business is going to be worth zero to three X EBITDA. If you have high revenue growth, but you aren't very profitable, you're going to be worth four to five times EBITDA. If you have high profit margins, but aren't growing very fast, you're going to be worth three to six times EBITDA. And if you're if you have high revenue growth and high profit margin, that's when you get into the seven X of EBITDA kind of range. Now, every industry is different. Um, yeah, some some kind of plays, especially businesses that that scale quickly, like technology businesses, might sell for different kind of multiples. But the, this this range, this chart, is a good template. For probably 95% of the businesses that are in EO, um, help them kind of understand where they are, and um, also helps you see, you know, by by changing profit margin, you know, kind of you can you can kind of begin to triangulate how a change in one of these factors can make you more profitable. <clears throat> so, um, I'll <coughs> conclude my my portion of this presentation by saying, what are the three action items I'm leaving you with today? Number one, start work on your book now. Um, uh, it takes time to do it. I know you're running a business, you've got family obligations, I get all that, but this is a really great exercise to start work on your book now. Start working on your 2X growth plan. You remember earlier on I said that the way private equity works, they wanna see two and a half percent, they wanna see 2.5 times return on their invested equity. Well, that translates mathematically to about a 2x growth of your business. So you want to you want to be thinking about developing and literally writing a plan to show how you could double the size of your business over a five year period. And finally, you you want to always be working on a strategic buyer profile. And let me so I want to I want to talk specifically about those last two items, and then we'll close and take questions. Here's what I mean about your 2x growth plan. Let's start in the, in the, in the box on the left. And every, every one of you can do this exercise and uh, it's, it's, it'll be helpful for you and you'll probably learn some things you didn't know about your business. Okay, 
we're gonna we're gonna we got products and services, we've got markets. So your your business is a function of products and services you provide and markets you sell to, right? It's just that simple. Break it down. No, no more complicated than that. So today, each of you have an existing set of products and services for ex for existing markets. That's your business today. But your growth plan can really go one of three ways. It can go this way. You can offer new products or services to your existing market, or you can offer your existing products and services into new markets, or you can offer new products and new services in new markets. Now that's painfully simple. You're all going, duh, thank you, Jim, for telling us that, that you know, blinding grasp of the obvious. But if you, if you really kind of break down where your business is today, in other words, the red box, and think about each of these kind of avenues, it'll help you kind of put some structure around your growth plan uh, I hear way too often the, the, the least believable thing you can ever say, the least believable thing you can ever say is, well, I'll just put more money in marketing. And if I put more money in marketing, I can grow my business. Well, if, you're good, if that's your strategy, articulate it in one of these three boxes. One of, one of these ways, you know, articulate how more money translates into more revenue. That's what I mean by work on your growth plan now so that if you meet with a buyer, especially a private equity buyer, you can say, look, uh, uh, Mr. or Miss Private Equity, here's my growth plan, because this is what they're really buying. Now, I've also talked about um, uh, strategic buyers. It's always important, and I've had this conversation recently with um, a lot of EO members, to how, how to think about um, for whom are you strategic and why? And here's a way to kind of break that down. <clears throat> Okay, let's assume um, on the horizontal axis, the, these are your competitors. And, and write down all of your competitors from small to large. And when I say competitors, I don't necessarily mean <coughs> companies that do what you do in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, I mean, people that you actually do compete with uh, tangentially uh, or directly, um, write them down, just you know, slap them down on a whiteboard and have their names on a sheet of paper. Then look at your value chain. And that, that means who are your suppliers and who are your customers? Write them down, just brainstorm it, just slap it on a sheet of paper. And I'm telling you, if you really force yourself to do this exercise, the best strategic buyer for your company is gonna be on this page. It's, it's, almost, a, it's almost a truism. And so I, I know that it's kind of hard to, think about it, um, but whenever I have a conversation with a potential client about going to market, we always walk through this, and there are lots and lots of situations where the best buyer for that company will crop up in the course of a conversation like this. So that's kind of what my, I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, I really wish, I really would wish you good luck, but in this environment, we know the wave is coming. We've talked about more money coming into the stock market. We've talked about the vaccine is going to be a catalyst for a whole lot more investment going forward. So um, as they say in Hawaii, um, hang 10. Uh, so let me just kind of stop there. Um, Marla, Samira, you said 20 minutes. I think I've gone about 20 minutes. Do you want to take questions or do you want to go straight to breakout groups now? I'll Let's do I'll do however you want to do questions. it. Questions. Um, if you want to quit sharing your screen, then we can all kind of see each other and take a few questions. That'd be great. And I'll let um, Brandon take back over. Awesome. Yeah. So let's get those questions start coming into the chat. And um, Jim, thank you so much for, for sharing this. My, my first obvious question is, um, are the, are the slides shareable for us and for our yeah. chapter? Cause I think that'd be super helpful for many of us to have. Um, yeah. And you know, I'm I'm really curious as to and if you have any specific examples you can share of um, any for people that have been planning their their playbook, like you mentioned. Um, have there been any any experiences that have gone especially well, like people that have done things especially well, or uh, 
on the inverse that have maybe not done things as well as they could have that you've that you've seen? Well, um, I would be subjecting myself to a you know a slander suit if I answered that question um, too directly. Um, you know, um, <coughs> I think I, I, this all kind of goes full circle. The situations that go the best are a function of preparation coming in, and um, um, when it, when a when a business owner is prepared and 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 have you know gone through a process like I've just described, it's it, the process tends to go uh, tends to go better. So uh, I don't have any any. <coughs> I think and I can give you antidote after antidote after antidote, or example after example, but it really comes down to to level of preparation. Uh, because I think I think the other thing I didn't say this, and maybe I should have added to my, to a bullet point. I think by going through the process of doing a book, it really helps you decide if you want to sell and really what the circumstances of doing a sale would be. So it's a kind of a, it, it's, a it's a thoughtful way of getting your brain wrapped around if you, do you want to do this or not. And so I think that's the, that's the, that's the most important principle I can give you guys. Okay, um, thank you. We have a question from, uh, let's see here, sorry, I'm trying to do, from Richard. I think this is interesting. Uh, Richard asks, are you surprised that valuations have stayed as high as they have over the last 12 months, especially during the pandemic? Or is that a function of there uh, being just too much money in the pipeline? Um, is it that there were deals that were already in progress that continued? Is it a, a matter of, um, uh, what what other factors might be driving those those very high valuations? Well, that's a that's a good question, um, um, <coughs> and it's it's maybe one element, one nuance I didn't talk about is um, there's a flight to quality, and I, I think I talked about that with, with the pandemic. That the pandemic has made companies much more, or buyers much more conservative, or um, maybe demanding in in demanding uncertainty so if you can if you can prove that you're a company of quality you can you can you can get those high multiples so it's um it's it's almost like the pandemic has helped better businesses because they they've proven their resiliency they've they've proven their stability uh so that's it yeah and there is more money coming in I haven't, I haven't met a reckless, there's more money coming in, but I haven't met a reckless PE buyer yet. No, nobody has been irresponsible with their cash flow, with their cash. So uh, I, I just think it's a function of the pandemic has helped quality company, companies bubble up and, and PE buyers will pay for quality companies. Great. Arnie asked, um, what are the top two or three things that tend to disappoint uh, private equity or other buyers in terms of value? Uh, what are things in businesses that, that may have them question or, or uh, not place as much value on, on a business? The, it, it, always, um, it, it always comes down to stability of the revenue stream. And um, when, a, when, a, when a seller leaves their company, <coughs> how much of the business might go with them. So if, if you've proven the resiliency of your revenue stream and the ability of your organization to manage in your absence, you've, you've crossed probably the biggest hurdle. But the second thing, um, and, and it, you know, how many times have I talked about the, the, the two and a half times invested equity principle? Um, a lot of business owners haven't, yeah, I don't know how to say this, they haven't been able to articulate what the growth plan is and if if the business owner can't articulate a growth plan you can't expect the buyer to figure it out and i i've seen i've seen many situations well not many that's an overstatement i've seen some situations where private equity group actually likes a company um they like the business they like the industry but they don't see a a that two and a half x on 
uh, invest in equity. So I think I think the resiliency of the revenue and the ability to grow the company are the two things that um, would cause an otherwise good buyer to, to say, well, thanks, but no thanks. And therefore, therefore have an effect on valuation, I guess, which is what the, the core of Arnie's question is. Um, Julie asked, in an asset purchase situation, what are the common pitfalls, especially at or after the close, that a seller could avoid? In an asset sale, um, well, um, a lot of it depends on the terms of the transaction. Um, if it's all cash, then you know you you know all cash means all cash. Um, oftentimes, uh, when you transfer assets, <clears throat> you have you have liabilities that have to be resolved, and making sure those are uh, properly you know handled at closing. Um, but it, it would all depend on the terms of the sale. For example, um, are there holdbacks? Are there escrows? Um, but if it's if it's a straight ahead asset sale straight ahead cash, there really isn't any risk. You've got, you've got some accounting issues after the fact with the buyer to resolve, you know, how much is allocated toward assets and how much is allocated toward goodwill. But that is generally an accounting conversation between each company's, you know, accounting firm. But that, that other than that, I don't see a whole lot of risk for, with an asset sale. So uh, something that's interesting, and this is a question for me, sorry to hog the, the air space. Um, I think, especially early on in my career, when I, there was a business that I had started that like, I saw as this is it. Like I wasn't building a business to try to sell it. I never, that thought never crossed my mind. And I think that might be something that's common for, I don't know, mm -hmm. many of us or maybe younger entrepreneurs or, or mm -hmm. beginning entrepreneurs is they're starting a business because they love it and not because they necessarily want to sell it the thought process behind building and developing a business with the either intent or possibility of a sale is maybe a little bit different. Have you seen, um, again, times that have maybe worked really well when there was a, a entrepreneur or business owner who was not planning on selling the business at all? but had done things that, that wound up um, helping with a strategic uh, exit or partnership for those entrepreneurs? Well, that's a really great question. And I can, I can assure you, I mean, I, I fall in that same category. When I left Disney to buy a radio business, I thought I was done. I mean, this was, this was what I was gonna do the rest of my life. Had never, I mean, the thought of selling it never even occurred to me. Um, and I got I got lucky, as I said, because of the nature of the change of the, in the radio industry. Um, um, but I had a really crappy business. I mean, I, I, I mean, it, it was not it was not ready to be sold. But because I had, I, I had a good business, I was very profitable. But the, I could have I wasn't ready to sell the business. I, I, I didn't I wasn't ready to maximize its value. But I got lucky because the, the, when a strategic buyer comes along and if you if you match strategically with the buyers looking for you can you can you can um, um, cover a lot of sins right don't don't you know if, if you if you find that met right match when it comes to private equity buyer there there's no such thing you've got to you've got to check every box and um, I think that um, being going starting a business knowing that you one day you are going to sell it is a very different animal than starting a business and saying i just want to run this for the rest of my life and kind of this will be my job for the rest of my life i've got a client now i'm working with they're not an eo member they're 41 years old started a business six years ago with the intention of selling it in eight years and he's already at 30 million dollars of revenue and, it, and he's he retained me to go ahead and sell it now but he, he's done some things that I mean, you would think he's been in business 25 years. He's got, you know, um, audited financials from year one. He's got a very diverse organization. I mean, he's, he's just done everything right because he, he started with the intention of selling it. And it's fascinating how he's got a better business because of it. Great. And just to continue on that, um, we, uh, me, sorry, 
and I, I have tended to think uh, again earlier earlier on in my career, I would think about selling a business as a one time you sell it, you're done, you move on. Um, I have a couple of friends who have recently shared experiences with me about um, very very successful uh, sales of businesses, but only in you know m- minority. Um, stakes to private equity. So uh, the, the, the actually where a private equity firm comes in and, and gets involved, they take a minority stake and they really help to continue to build and develop the business beyond what the entrepreneur maybe could do on their own. Um, so continuing on that thought would be how often are you seeing uh, those or are you involved with those sort of transactions versus uh, a complete sale and exit of the well, so, so, <clears throat> so what was the question again? That so I got everything up to the very last sentence. Yeah, sorry. The so how how often is it that you are helping your clients in a sale of a business that is not a complete sale? That's maybe just a for a portion where there is a strategic partner that comes yeah, in and gets yeah. involved. Uh, yeah, I, I should I maybe should have clarified that when it comes to a private equity buyer, you can almost assume that the private equity buyer is not going to buy 100% of the company. I mean, that's very, very rare for them to come in and write a check for 100%. The, the basic model for private equity, there, there, there are about 4,200 private equity firms registered uh, with the SEC, um, and there are probably at least that many independent sponsors that are not registered. So let, let's call it six or 7,000 just to be conservative. Firms that are running around out there trying to make acquisitions. Their basic model is to, to, to buy um, uh, 60 to 80 percent of the company, and have you stay on, and and as they as the phrase roll act, roll equity, and stay on for for uh, to participate in the growth of the company and for that second exit. Um, so that's that's almost the assumption going in. There there are, I don't work with a lot of private equity when it comes to making minority investments. I've got a I've got a pretty strong point of view that. Minority investors are not a great thing. Um, uh, they they can be um, in kind of very narrow circumstances. Maybe very specifically, if um, um, you've got a very clear growth plan and you need capital to facilitate that growth plan. Um, but um, uh, but generally speaking, <clears throat> when it comes to a private equity buyer, you almost have to assume you're going to stay involved. Okay, and continuing on that, here's a tactical question from Luke, which is, uh, Luke says, the uh, 800 pound gorilla in his industry is looking to acquire his business. The his business checks every box you've mentioned for successful exit. And the um, other company has major money behind them. With that said, they typically do 30% upfront, 50% earn out, 20% stock. And Luke asks, are, do you have any advice from a negotiation standpoint on how to um, change the structure of that so that uh, maybe there's more cash up front, less earn out, less stock um, without totally ruining the deal? Um, <clears throat> well, the... <clears throat> the best negotiation tactic out there is the ability to say no. And um, a no can be a polite no, but it no means no. And um, um, the, um, the, the, if, if the 800 pound gorilla is doing a bunch of deals, um, buying with stock i mean that something about that feels a little messy to me like they may be creating a mess for themselves <laughs> um, um so um i mean i i wouldn't advise it'd, it'd be interesting to go i i know there's some senior folks on this call some folks that have, have been around the, the block a few times i bet you if we took a vote knowing nothing else who would take that deal today the vote would pretty overwhelmingly be I can see Barney shaking his head. <laughs> Don't do it. And so, um, um, you know, a uh, not doing a um, 
you know, I, my, my mentor, a guy who helped me uh, when I bought my radio business, who, who's, who's still a good friend to this day, the guy's 85 years old and very successful entrepreneur, has a saying that he'd rather, how does he say that? I'd rather miss out <clears throat> on on three bad deals. How did, I'd, I'd rather miss out on three good deals than make one bad deal and, and recognize that you only have one chance to sell your business. Um, and if it's a bad deal, then you're you're really really it created you're, put yourself in a box. Um, so uh, the best negotiating strategy is to say no, thank you. Um, and here here's what I will sell for. And if they and then frankly, let me tell you, if your business it goes back to this whole notion of a strategic buyer. Right, the, one of the first bullet points I, I said I, I'm trying to uh, can't pull it up right now, but if your business is strategic to theirs. You, you've got a lot of negotiating leverage, a lot, a lot. <laughs> Don't assume that you've got to fall into their, their formula. If your business really meets a need um, that they're trying to fill, your ability to say no is very powerful. I love that quote. Um, that's like probably my biggest takeaway is the best negotiation strategy is the ability to say no. I love that. So good. Mm -hmm. Um, let's do one last question real quick uh, from Teresa, and then we'll break out into small groups for 15 minutes, and then um, everyone will come back on to share some highlights uh, in the last couple of minutes. So here's the last question from Teresa, which is, once you assemble your book, your company book, uh, and perhaps you're not yet ready to move forward, mm -hmm. how would you suggest that book be used for planning and she said specifically in the event of the owner's sudden death um, but mm -hmm. i think that question may be relevant in other areas too how do you continue to use that book for growth when you're maybe not quite ready for for a sale well that's a great question and it, it gets to the heart of the value of the book that the, the book provides it, it, it ends up being a template is what it ends up being that that you can um, um, if, if you told me you didn't, you really didn't intend to sell for five years, I'd say, great, go ahead and do your book now and update it. Um, um, and then if something does happen, you know, at death, or like I said, go back to the seven D's, uh, divorce, disengagement, uh, whatever. I mean, I'm telling you, trust me when I tell you, these are the calls I get <laughs> and they always start with, I mean, they all fall into one of those seven, you know, buckets and you don't know when it's going to happen. You just don't know what's going to happen. So you, you, if you had that book ready, it, it really has provided the template for you to hand it to somebody and go, okay, here's what has to happen next in, in my business, whether that's a spouse or a partner or um, uh, whatever it may be, you, you, you've, got a, you've got that roadmap for them to, to work with. <clears throat> Wonderful. Jim, uh, this has been so insightful and helpful for for our chapter, we really appreciate your time. We're going to go ahead and um, break into our small groups now. Any questions that we didn't get to, sorry, I'm doing my best uh, to try to get to everyone's. Um, mm -hmm. Any that we didn't get to, we can forward to Jim and he can help answer for us. And sure. so now moving into our small groups, we have a couple of prompt questions for you guys to talk about. The first is, what did Jim bring to light for you? Second, do you need a mini forum about this, whether it's for your own planning, your own um, whatever. Number three, what is the most innovative thing you've seen a company do during this COVID period? It's a good question. And yeah. number four, what are the next steps for your business? What comes next? So those are our four questions for the breakout groups. And it looks like Marla is so awesome and on it, dropping them in the chat to reference. So now Samira will break us all out. Please do stay on afterwards for the last couple of minutes. We'll come back and, and share some highlights.